Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 2024 Weggie Prize Awards. We're coming to you live from Kendall College of Art and Design of Ferris State University in Grand Rapids, Michigan, USA. My name is Gail DeBryan, and I'm the chair of the Collaborative Design, Master of Arts in Design programs here at KCAD, as well as their sustainability officer. To everyone in this room, and to all of you tuning in from around the world, thank you for joining us today, the 11th Weggy Prize Awards. For over a decade, Weggy Prize has empowered college and university students from around the world to collaborate across boundaries and envision game-changing solutions to complex, layered, wicked problems facing our world. And while today may seem like the end of a nine-month design process, for many of our teams, it's just the beginning. What began as a simple research plan has evolved into full prototypes, and in some cases, active businesses, all motivated by improving our communities and planet. Through today's presentations, we'll see how these ideas can help us rethink the way we produce and consume, moving from a linear economy in which we take, make, and dispose to a more circular economy that is restorative and regenerative by design. And finalists or not, the real measure of success for all teams taking part in the Weggie Prize exists in their ability to nurture their concepts into concrete solutions advancing their projects and by personal growth beyond the scope of this competition to enact tangible impact in the world. In our 11 years, we've encountered a multitude of unique and inspiring ideas that have capitalized on momentum gained here at the prize to evolve beyond the conclusion of this program. You may remember Janali Modi and Isabel Campbell from last year's winning team, Banana Leather. After their graduation from Yale and the conclusion of Weggie Prize, Janali returned to India to work on her company, Banafi Leather, full time, creating plant-based leather from banana fibers and agricultural waste. In the September following, they competed in the Halt Prize, a global finals, and won securing $1 million in additional funding. Uh, please applaud. Very exciting. Another of last year's winners, Vasco Casca from Green Poultry Farm, has championed his team's ideas forward to additional competitions, gaining support from the United Nations Development Program and the Government of Italy. Let's give him a round. With the team's Weggie Prize winnings, they were able to purchase necessary equipment and now have their biodigester systems up and in two Mozambique poultry farms. Countless other past participants have gone on to carry their passions for collaborative problem solving and the circular economy into new and known organizations, continuing Weggie Prize's global impact. Today we hear from five teams of students who have spent the last nine months working to envision their own compelling and realistic solutions to wicked problems of their choosing. But before we get started, nothing you see here today would be possible without the continued financial support of the Weggie Foundation. For over 50 years, the foundation has been planting seeds that develop leaders in econometrology, health, education, and the arts, while enhancing the lives of people here in West Michigan and around the world. We are beyond grateful for the foundation's leadership and support, and we look forward to continuing the important work of Weggie Prize in 2025 and beyond. I'd also like to thank KCAD and its Weggie Center for Sustainable Design for supporting Weggie Prize from the beginning. This competition has been shaped by the creativity, experience, and perspective KCAD brings to the table as a college of art and design. We'd also like to expend, extend a very special thanks to one of our team members who will be retiring from Weggie Prize after this year, sorry. Jill Armstrong has been working with us for 10 years, keeping us organized and this event on track. She has been integral, part of the prize success. We are forever grateful. Thank you, Jill. You will be missed. <laughs> and last but not least, we thank every single student who's participated in Weggie Prize 2024. Regardless of your standing in this competition, your ideas hold significance. Your efforts are invaluable, and the teamwork, leadership, and empathy you have demonstrated are exactly what we need to overcome the challenges before us today and those that lie ahead. Before we begin, I have a few more notes on the day. Cheering is welcome. 
If not here, then please cheer on social media and use the hashtags KCAD and Weggy Prize when you do. And be sure to connect with us by following at Weggy Prize on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and by following the KCAD Weggy Center for Sustainable Design on LinkedIn. We also have a Weggy Prize LinkedIn group you can join to start connecting with former participants and other folks from around the world. Although applause is encouraged, we do ask that you please silence your cell phones to avoid interrupting the event. If you need access to the Wi-Fi here on campus, you can do so using the network KCAD Guest. Logging credentials are around the room and on signs on the door check-in table. There are restrooms located on this floor. There are signs in the hallway to help guide you. Please don't hesitate to ask one of us if you need extra help. There will be a 10 minute break after the third presentation for everyone to stretch and refresh. Finally, this is an accessible virtual event. We're pleased to offer captioning of today's presentations as well as sign language interpretation, courtesy of American Sign Language Interpreters from the Deaf and Hard of Hearing um, who are here with us today. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our MC Bridget Clark Whitney, President and Founding CEO of Kids Food Basket, a grassroots community organization that nourishes children to reach their full potential. Please give a warm welcome to Bridget. Thank you, Gail. It's so back to be, so wonderful to be here in person for another Weggy Prize. What an honor. I can't wait to see what our finalist teams have in store for us today. And while our focus might be on the 2024 finalists, we'll start by celebrating all who have engaged with Weggy Prize. With 58 teams representing over 100 academic institutions in 38 different countries, studying over 150 unique disciplines. This year's competition was one of the most competitive and diverse yet. Forged by an interdisciplinary spirit, this competition is all about helping participants incorporate diverse perspectives into their work. At each of the four phases of competition, teams receive valuable feedback from multiple judges. And it's because of this personalized approach that the quality of ideas and projects continues to increase year over year. Speaking of feedback, let's meet our core panel of judges. These dedicated professionals each bring unique expertise to the table. They've given an enormous amount of time and energy to provide our teams with focused feedback and guidance throughout the whole competition. While we certainly want your applause, please hold it until the end. First, one of our judges, Deanna Anderson, unfortunately couldn't be here today due to a family emergency, but we'd still like to thank her for her impact up to this point. Deanna is the current editorial director at Next City, a nonprofit newsroom that covers solutions to so social issues in cities. Prior to this, she served as a senior editor at Green Biz, where her beat was the circular economy. Deanna has also reported for Yes! Magazine, NPR affiliate station KLCC, The Lily, Atmos, and others. She sends her best wishes to all the teams. And next, our judges here today. Christopher Carter is an educator, a seasoned animator, and storyboard artist, and a highly regarded sculptor whose work has been featured in numerous museum and gallery exhibitions and private collections. He's also a trustee of the Weggy Foundation and the designer behind the Carter Project, an innovative live workspace meets sculptural installation that he created using shipping containers. Alicia Garmalevich is the founder and director of Materium, an open platform for biomaterial recipes and property data. As an associate professor of the circular economy at the Universidad de Santiago de Chile and as an associate fellow at Oxford University, she researches and teaches about digital fabrication and the circular economy with a particular focus on open data and local material markets for 3D printing. Shell Martín y Pardo is a writer, research, and professor based in Spain. Shell is a founding member of the NGO, the Cascade Collective for Cultural Sustainability, as well as a professor, professor of anthropological, 
Cultural and Religious Studies at IES Abroad in Barcelona, and a research associate at the Smithsonian Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. Tom Newhouse is the owner and principal of Thomas J. Newhouse Design, an industrial design consulting firm located here in West Michigan. Tom is a West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum Hall of Famer, lecturer and designer with an emphasis on environmentally sustainable design practices. Nathan Shedroff is a professor at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, where he founded the groundbreaking MBA in Design Strategy program. He's also an author, a serial entrepreneur, and a pioneer in experience design, interaction design, and information design, who researches, speaks, and teaches internationally. B.K. Singh, the co-founder of Green Roots Consultants and former professor of soil science and plant nutrition at Earth University in Costa Rica. He was one of the lead scientists in MasterCard Foundation's grant to develop global masters in health and sustainable development and one of the principal investigators in the U.S. Department of Energy funded biofuel project. He has developed registered and introduced 25 products in international markets to improve soil plant health, water purification, and public sanitation. Bill Stow of Bill Stow LLC is the founder of Sustainable Research Group and the West Michigan Sustainable Business Forum and has over 40 years experience working in environmental and sustainable business issues in a variety of capacities. He currently provides strategic advice to management teams on sustainable business practices. Colin Webster from Edinburgh, Scotland, has worked with the UK-based Ellen MacArthur Foundation for 10 years, creating resources for universities and businesses, designing courses and running workshops, and creating podcasts and videos all about the circular economy. Joe Williams is a circular economy learning consultant based in the UK running classes and workshops for various clients and business executives. Having worked for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation for eight years, Joe set up the world's first circular economy fellowship program and is now a senior tutor for the University of Exeter's Circular Economy Masterclass. Welcome back to all of our judges. We would also like to recognize this year's preliminary judges, who were key in reviewing team's work throughout the first phase. If you're here in the audience, please stand so we may say hello. Janan Cotto of Children's First Children's Finance. Michelle Sapala, Michelle Sapala Gibbs of Hope College. John Kinch of Michigan Energy Options. Mary Ellen Mika of Steelcase. Lisa Oliver King of Our Kitchen Table. Wendy Ogilvie of Natural Resource Connections. Stephanie Ogren of the Grand Rapids Public Museum. David Renard, formerly of Steelcase. Wendy Schlett of Foresight Management. And Kristen Wieland of Resource Recycling Systems. Thank you, judges. All of our judges have been so instrumental in helping make Weggy Prize 2024 a meaningful and memorable experience for all of our participants. We thank you so much. And now it's time for our finalist teams to share their ideas with the world. Following the presentations, we will be awarding $65,000 in total cash prizes to these teams. With the idea inspiring the greatest hope for real world success, taking home first place and $30,000. Each finalist team has designated one member to present. And due to some unexpected travel issues, two of our teams will be presenting virtually. All presenters will have 10 minutes to outline their team's solution in its entirety, followed by a 10 minute Q&A session with the judges. That part's great. Presenters, you will hear the following warning sign when you have one minute left. There it is. The same sound will be played again when your time is up. And now for our first team, Fru Fresh, presenting virtually from Rwanda, is Claudine Kamanzi from Rwanda, studying conservation agriculture at Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture. Good morning, hello Claudine. 
How good are morning. you? I'm good. Good. We're so happy to have you today. Are you ready to present? Yes, I'm happy to present and excited. Wonderful. Well, welcome. The stage is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kamanzi Prodin from Rwanda. I'm here representing my team. Allow me to talk about Rwanda Nage culture, which is mostly one of the sectors that I'm engaging in. According to the, the Rwanda Nage culture employs over 70% of the population, and it contributes to 27% to the, 27 to the GDP of the country. But unfortunately, 27.5% are being, are being lost due to lack of proper storage facility. Allow me to talk about Jane, hardworking farmer, who is a vendor and, and a farmer. Jane sells over 10, 10 tons but 40% of her production are being lost due to lack of proper storage facility. As a coach has saying, she told me that I could, now I couldn't be able to feed or to pay school fees for my kid due to, due to the increase of uh, deterioration of my tomatoes. So um, today I'm talking, I'm not talking about Jen only, I'm also talking about two, thousand, more than thousand farmers who are engaged in tomato production. This farmers produces over 81 metric ton, but according to the, the research I've shown that 50 to 60% of their, uh, their production are being lost along the value chain, which is this big issue, big, very big issue. If this could continue, this will result to the, uh, the high risk of London, where there will be increase of malnutrition, also the greenhouses gases. As free fresh tip, we brought a solution which is called chakokura. Chakokura is a evaporative natural, is natural evaporative, zero energy cooling chain, and it can be able to keep the tomatoes up to weeks without being deteriorated. This charcoal cooler has, has ability to reduce temperature up to uh, nine to 10 degrees Celsius, and it is being made from the locally available materials. This charcoal cooler, it operates on the principle of, of, of operating cooling, where charcoal is, is porous with many tin hole, giving it high water holding capacity. When water is sprinkled through the charcoal in the wall, of the cooler chamber, the charcoal become moist. As the hot air moves through the moist charcoal, heat from the hot air is trans transferred to the water, causing water to evaporate. This evaporation process removes heat from the system, resulting to the cooler air inside the chamber and creates refri refrigerator effect. As a result of this charcoal cooler, it, ex it extends shelf life of tomatoes and its cost saving, reduce the losses and improve marketability of the, the tomatoes as the tomatoes are being kept in the, in, the cooler, in the cooler chamber. Next, please. As the materials, this charcoal cooler has different materials. It's made from charcoal leftover, timber, bricks, and water. As material analysis, like this uh, charcoal that this coolers that we're bringing, has, every single material has, has its load to, to that has its load that sprays while it is cooling. Next, please. So, as a, a free fresh team, we we after seeing after uh, getting the the solution, we come up with the design which is uh, can uh, be able to fit to our environment. This is my friend Tade who was uh, just de uh, designing, the, the, um, uh, following the design, as well as he was trying to see if this design can be able to, to cool to the, the nine to 10 degrees Celsius. Next, please. 
as we were testing, we found that we, we took our, our charcoal cooler, a small one, and then we, we take it and the way we took our tomatoes and then we keep it. And we have been able to keep it for 13 days without being deteriorated, which shows that this charcoal cooler has an important role to reduce post harvest loss of tomatoes. Next, please. So we can ask yourself, how is it, this is it being Sakura? So for us, our tomatoes that were used, uh, they, as uh, for our chocolates that we're using, the chocolates that we're using, we're using leftover chocolates. The statistics shows that 70% of London rely on charcoal while they, they are cooking. But after cooking, there's 20% of, of chocolates that is left behind where they, they are being thrown in the environment. For us, we, we as Free Fresh, we are relying on this 20% those uh, charcoals we don't want to be wasted. We'll be taking these charcoals and use it in our charcoal and for, and we use it our charcoal so that it can maintain the, the, our tomatoes up to two weeks without being deteriorated. And after three years, we're planning to, 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 to replace the charcoal where we'll be uh, crushing them and mixed it with soil so that it can even help the soil increase the nutrients like mag magnesium, calcium, and potassium. So for water, we'll be using rain harvesting water. We'll be taking the, we have tank where we'll be collecting water and after collecting water, we'll be used in our charcoal cooler. Next, please. As an investment plan, so we are trying the, the investment, the first one we'll be investing is land, charcoal, bricks, tanks, and timber. So as our revenue, it's, it will be, it will cost us uh, 40, over 40,000 USD, and our cost it will be 26, over 26,000. So as a return on investment, it will be 55%. The payback period will, will be, uh, almost eight months, which is equal to 0 0.6 years. Next, please. So how do we be distributing our service? For us, we'll be saving tomato farmers and the retailers, and they will be charging according to the storage fees, where the, the cost will be, will be charging 0 0.01 USD per kg by the weekly. So for us, we'll be taking the charcoal on the market where it will be, it will be easy and affordable to the, to the farmers, where the farmers will be taking their tomatoes and bring it to their charcoal cooler and then we keep it while they're waiting for someone to, to buy their produce of tomato. Next, please. So okay, our stakeholders you have is retailers, wholesaler, cooperative, and the National Agriculture Export Board. And our very competitive advantages that we have is zero energy system. And it will also serve in remote area as this charcoal cooler doesn't require electricity to operate. Next, please. So as an impact assessment, we have fun. First, socially to contribute to food food security and safety, and it will reduce unemployment rate, as well as for environment, it will do to, it will contribute to proper wastage of management and reduce greenhouse gases. So, by economically, it will bring it will, uh, bring the uh, the income for us as people who are providing the storage uh, services and for the the retired farmers who will be able to keep their produce for a long time. So, as the NSD that we are pro uh, we are working on is uh, zero hunger and no poverty. Next, please. Uh, so our key main activities that we'll be doing as free fresh team. So first we'll be constructing charcoal cooler on the market, in the market where it can be uh, able to be affordable. Also we'll be uh, providing the, the capacity building to the farmers as well as it will, will provide the storage services. Next, please. So we are planning to 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 gain our main action plan is for three years. One will be operating over 80%. For first, for the second, will be 100% uh, of it will be able to reach 2,000 smallholders, farmers, and retailers. And then we will be able to, to give uh, 50 jobs to the 
uh, um, youth and and the small uh, and the people. So also as uh, our barrier we're facing is first is insufficient fund because we don't have now a uh, core amount to invest, but we're still finding how we can get enough money. So also is the adaptation to the technology. As the, the survey that we have done found that the farmer doesn't even ha have proud this track of color. So we found that is a, this is will be a cha is challenges, but we are focusing, we will be educating through workshop and try to get, get to help them know how this charcoal cooler work. Next, please. And for all this charcoal cooler, this is a, a team behind of it, a team with diverse skills who are willing and able to serve the community. Thank you so much. So join me in this in this journal of reducing post harvest losses. Claudine, great work. I know it's difficult to present virtually, but you did an awesome job. Love the charcoal kohler idea. So we're going to take a few minutes for the judges to deliberate, and, and then they'll come back and ask you some questions as well. So in the meantime, tell us, how did you get involved in, and what is your inspiration for conservation agriculture? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, as I was grown in the family where they, all, all my parents lie on, on agriculture, because agriculture, as I said, it improves 70% of the population. It means that our parents, uh, most of our parents are being engaged in, in agriculture. So after I grow up, I studied science, but I found that if I can go back and uh, use it, the science and learn more about agriculture, there's something that I could go, I can do to just to help the increase of the production, because what they was what they, our, my parents were doing was kind of traditional. But I wanted to go and gain the skills and come back in the, my community, teach my parents, and also people know my, my community. Thank you so much. Good for you. That's great. Uh, judges, are we ready? Or need a couple, few more minutes? Good to go. All right. Good luck. Thank you. I'll start in that, in that case. Thank you very much for your presentation. Lovely to see. Um, one thing that wasn't clear to me was how do you collect the charcoal from Rwandans? What's the process? Okay, Is there any costs involved? Okay, thank you so much. As I said, that 70% of the people living in Rwanda, we use charcoal while we are cooking. And 20% of it are being, are being thrown away from the school, from houses, even from where they, 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 they place in the, where they make charcoals. For us, we'll be hiring someone like, to, collect, to collect those uh, leftover charcoals, and then after we collect it, and then we we'll put it in the place where we'll be breeding our charcoal cooler. Thank you. move the microphone closer. Um, I love this idea. I think it's really simple and I love the idea of you using local materials. Um, one of the questions I've got is, is it possible to make a mobile version of this so that you can bring crops in from even further out um, and into the city? Is that something that you've thought about? Uh, yeah, I've thought about it, but the mobile one, so it's so hard since it uses uh, water, so it, can, it might be hard for the, like, every time fetching water. So we thought that something can be a mobile, like stay somewhere where it can be used, uh, accessed with uh, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, relative humidity of the air and temperature in the area where you want to put this facility. Okay. As I said that this uh, charcoal could have ability to maintain nine, uh, nine degrees Celsius to 10 degrees Celsius. So it means that in, in the, during the day, there will be somehow 
but they they will be somehow uh, hot. But as the water moving out, moving in the in the charcoal, and the, well, they they will be able to maintain the the coordinates inside the charcoal cooler, which will be like the the humidity wouldn't be like a big problem because it will be uh, happen based on the how how we are entering how we are. We are sprinkling water, or how we are, we are putting water into the, our charcoal cooler. Thank you so much. Do you have like meteorological data of the area where you want to put these facilities? Like temperature, oh, oh. relative humidity of the air? Yeah. So in Rwanda, it sound, it, since we'll be working on the eastern province where it's somehow in the where it is uh, hotter. So for us, this shows that the, the, the Rwandan uh, climate shows that 20 over eight, between 18 and 20 degrees Celsius. That's how the 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 crime, the hotness it will be. So which that I feel that it doesn't it will not affect the 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 coolness inside the old chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the presentation. I, I agree with Joe that it's such a clear um, and clearly presented concept. I'm going to combine a couple questions that the judges have been sharing amongst themselves. Um, I noticed that the largest loss of produce happens at the retail level. Is this solution, so, uh, are you planning on having it in retail markets or is it going to be at a, a more centralized location? Thank you so much. So our thought is just to put on the near the market where the, the retailers can take their produces or while they're waiting for someone to buy their produces, they can be able, they can put it in our cooler. Once they get someone to buy their product, they can be able to come and take it and be able to sell it. And this may be obvious, but uh, is it possible to store more than just tomatoes in, in this facility, I assume? Yeah, so for our facilities that we're, we're, we'll be making, this is has ability to keep over 30 tons of tomatoes, which will be easier for some many retailers to access to the, the to our chocolate cooler. Thank you. So I count. I just think your solution is a wonderful, appropriate technology effort. It's great. Uh, my question is on water, the water supply. <clears throat> How are you getting the water up in and then onto all the charcoal? That's the first question. And then what is the ratio then of the evaporated verse versus the amount of water that you then can recycle back into the cooler? Thank you so much for the water. So for the, the, the charcoal cooler will be kind of it looks like a normal house, but at the, the below the roof there will be the the pump, which has different um, uh, where the water will be coming, moving from up to the the uh, to the charcoal. And for these charcoals, like will be able to the more water that goes down down, the, it will be few water, but there is another pump. Like that will be taking it and put it there. There is a tank which we will, will, will plan to like, which will be breathing somewhere, and it will have a pump where those water will move forward and up to the tank. And then once you want to reuse it again, so we we'll pump it to the the main tank. I, I think Thank I you saw. So much. I think I saw in your presentation that this is a zero energy solution, but you just talked about pumps for the water. What's powering the pumps? So the, the pump, so uh, like we, we thought that that's technology is a way of collecting the water because it will go uh, down and then we have, you know, this, uh, how do you have, how do you, do you usually get water in the, in the lobbies at home? That's how we be opening it, and water comes back, like goes back to the system. Thank you. Um, 
So thank you for um, tackling the issue of food waste, uh, because if food waste was a country in the world, uh, it would be the third uh, um, um, actor in uh, producing climate change. So thank you for tackling this one. Um, how have you guys calculated the price uh, for the farmers, what it will cost the farmers to keep or to bring you the tomatoes into the refrigerator um, versus them losing or wasting those tomatoes? Thank you so much. So before we come up with this idea, we make market survey. We went to the retailers and then we, we asked some information. We tried to understand how to be the favorable or the, the price where they can be able to, to afford. And then we come up with the, the price which where the, the retailers will be able to will be able to pay. This is almost 12 London francs. So we can't, can't we, uh, we also consider the amount of tomatoes that farmers in general, they are, they are just producing or they're selling in the uh, weekly. And then we come up with this, uh, this amount of money that we'll be charging. I have a question for you. Um, <clears throat> again, thank you very much for your presentation. One question is, uh, why did you choose tomatoes over other types of produce that I imagine also have losses associated with their production? Why is tomatoes the, the first approach you're, you're taking? And then second, are you looking at other types of produce also being stored? Thank you so much. Why tomatoes? So because the tomatoes is the high value crops in Rwanda. So we as people, for instance, I consume it uh, twice a day. So it means that the tomatoes everyone need is something that needs. If these tomatoes are being uh, spoiled every single day, means that it will be, uh, it will be, high, it will be, uh, it will be high cost. They, they to, uh, for the people want to access, the, he or she doesn't uh, will not be able to access because, because it will be expensive. So that's why we choose tomatoes. But as we keep up, as we grow, we're planning to even to include these uh, perishable crops like to, uh, like uh, carrots, cabbages. So, but we first we cut, we first uh, started with tomatoes due to like being uh, high consumable every single day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here I come. All set? Uh, Please. We have just 20 another seconds. question, you know. I'm really curious about leftover charcoal. I, I just want to understand what is leftover charcoal. It is burnt charcoal. If it is burnt charcoal, its porosity is going to be very, very low and the air flow, it will restrict the air flow completely. So I don't know how you manage that. Okay, thank you so much. So I will say that it's after cooking, there's leftover charcoal. For us, that's what we'll be, we'll be using, we'll be increasing. Since this charcoal is kind of not small, it's kind of small, not that big, which is that even water will be resist and be able to, to, to keep, be able to, to be maintained inside. Yeah, that's the leftovers, that's the charcoal where they, they will be collecting from homes after, be, after you being used, the, the main charcoals after them being used while they are, are cooking. So we'll be collecting after, after them being, uh, after they finish cooking. Thank you. Thank you, judges, great questions. Claudine, excellent work, thank you so much. Fantastic. Let's give Claudine a round of applause. You're welcome. Thank you, Team Fruit Fresh. Okay, we'll now welcome our next presenter. Representing Team EcoFeed Pioneers is Trezor Mabana, also from Rwanda, studying conservation agriculture at Rwanda Institute for Conservation Agriculture. Welcome, Trezor. Thank you so much. All right, are you feeling ready? Yeah, I feel ready. Okay, good luck. The stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. So, um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Amawana Chazol, and I'm representing the EcoFit Pioneers from Rwanda. 
So uh, before I start my presentation, let me tell you a short background story of how our story was originated. So um, since I was young, I, wa I wanted to join the agriculture sector. So after finishing my high school, I joined the most prestigious agriculture institution in Rwanda called Rika. So in the first few weeks on campus, I wanted to explore the surrounding of the campus. And that's when I stumbled upon this 50 hectare large farm. And it was composed with soybean and maize, two of the primary staple crops of humans in Rwanda. And I was really amazed because it was my first time seeing this large scale farm in the country. Uh, it was really mechanized and I was really astonished, but it faded away after the farm manager told me that all these soybeans and maize is only meant for feed production or animal consumption. Uh, I was really troubled because uh, at that time, uh, in those surrounding communities, there were many starving people and starving children and who were really undernourished. I, I wondered why this farm prioritized feeding the animals when there was people are starving in the surrounding communities. So I dig deeper and I did uh, more research on this feed production and the numbers that I found, they were really troubling. Uh, according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, 21, 2021 report, they say uh, that above 70% of the global soybean and maize produce, uh, it is meant for, uh, for animal feed production, uh, for feeding only the animals. And according to the World, Fru uh, World Food Program Annual Country Report in 2022, they mentioned that three out of 10 people in the sub-Saharan Africa uh, are really under newlished and food insecure. The food they're supposed to eat is being fed to the animals and three out of 10 people don't have anything to eat. That's really troubling. And it's not only that, the production of the soybean and maize isn't environmental, uh, environmentally sustainable, as for every metric ton of corn grain produced, it emits about 350 kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalents of the greenhouses into the atmosphere. So this gives rise to a wicked problem. A wicked problem is the human livestock nutrition conflict in sub-Saharan Africa, but specifically our scope narrows down to Rwanda for, to be more specific. So it is, uh, it is given rise to the, to the, the set, of, uh, 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 set of reasons, like raw production of soybean and maize in the country. Rwanda is a small country, roughly the, roughly the land size of the Maryland, and um, it has the low agriculture land, which means there should, there should be low production of the agriculture, things like soybean and maize. And also there is the increase of the human population. Calentry, uh, at the small size of Rwanda, it supports the population of 13 million, the high pop one of the dense populated countries in Africa. And it is believed that in 2050, the population will almost double. To mean that the population of humans is increasing, we have to feed those humans, even though the land is not increasing. And also there is the increasing demand of meat-based product. As the country that is developing, there is the middle class, uh, there is the middle class that is developing, which demands more meat-based products, which means that we have to feed also the livestock feeding those and feeding those humans. And even though we have low production, the human population is increasing and the demand is increasing. We don't produce more, so we have to rely on imports, which is not very sustainable for the country. So our proposed solution is to find another better alternative of livestock, uh, of livestock feeding instead of integrating it with the human feeding so that they can be separated and each one might, be, might leave each other alone. So we are proposing to, to, for, the, uh, for the livestock nutrition to, to use the protein-rich sources, which is called alfalfa, an underutilized resource in Rwanda that can be biorefined and form uh, a, nutri a, nutrition, uh, a nutritious animal feed for the animals. So you can wonder yourself, what is biorefining? Biorefining is the process of converting the biomass into a more valuable product. Like for example, we'll be converting alfalfa, uh, underutilized protein-rich resource in Rwanda, and the eggshells. The eggshells are the waste materials for egg consumption, and the cassava bran are the waste materials from the cassava processing. So the, combining these waste materials, we biorefine them and make them into the animal feed, the, which is superior and very nutritious, to just go and replace those soya beans and the maize to focus them on human nutrition rather than animal nutrition, so to balance out that conflict. So what product are we offering? We are offering, firstly, the protein plus pellets, as you can see them here. So uh, they, are made for, uh, they are made from biorefined uh, alfalfa by integration of the that cassava brand and eggshells. Uh, they are really affordable because they are made from local resource materials and they, they, they would help to balance the livestock and human nutrition where it will shift away the livestock nutrition from the soybean and maize and that will be focused on human, human nutrition. So it will balance it out. And also to promote the monogastric livestock production like pigs, rabbits, and chicken. So it is really surprising in the sub-Saharan Africa and specifically in Rwanda, the, the, the pork and even the chicken meat is really expensive compared to the beef, which is different from here. Because people don't tend to invest in that because their feed production is not affordable in those country regions. And it is really environmental sustainable compared to the beef production. Yeah, so it will shift to that. And the, our second product, which is considered as a byproduct, is the uh, alfalfa brown juice fertilizer, which is made, for, which is made from the fermentation of the byproduct of the, uh, of the production of those pellets. 
Uh, it is an organic fertilizer. It can be a good alternative for the chemical fertilizers which are not uh, environmental friendly. So uh, our production process uh, is, six, is the six uh, step process but can be categorized into four, four categories, which is acquiring raw materials like alfalfa, a biorefining process. Uh, it is an automized process. It uses machines for drying, particle size homogenization through grinding, mixing, and even pelletizing those pellet materials and packaging and distribution and the recycling of pro production waste. So our production process entails entails all the principles of circular economy, uh, such as eliminating waste as our production process uses waste products like, such as eggshells, uh, egg uh, cassava bran, uh, and also it regenerates natural systems, like for example, uh, our, our, our livestock feed is used to feed the animals, which gives them manure output. That manure output goes back to the alfalfa fields to, to fertilize them, and the cassava fields to give back our raw materials. And even the packaging and distribution, the packaging will be careful to use the biodegradable packages and that can, they can be biodegradable and, and also be recyclable for, for the reuse. Yeah. Uh, to the prototyping, we used generally four, processes, uh, four steps. Uh, first, we did the literature review where we had to read articles and uh, books and lab reports of the experiments that, were, that are similar to, the, to, to our project. The second, we did the laboratory analysis. As you can see here, I was doing the laboratory analysis of the fiber of, uh, of alfalfa to see that uh, monogastric animals can support them. And the prototyping, we did the prototype development according to the data we got from the laboratory. Uh, uh, and we did the formulation of our feeds. Then after we did the prototype testing on the field. Uh, because we're doing animal feed, we tested it on the animals. We tested it on nine pigs, uh, comparing it to the two dominant feed, pro feed producers of feeds in Rwanda, which is Zamora feed pellets and Gorilla feed pellets. And the results we saw that we saw that they act in a similar way. The average, uh, the average weight that the animals gained was actually the same. To mean that they impact the animal in the same way and in the same manner. Uh, so to our business model, let's first talk about the production. Uh, we, we, we will have two phases of production. The first phase will be starting the puzzle. The, the, uh, the first phase will start in the puzzle and the phase two will be completing the puzzle. So in the first phase, we'll be investing more in promoting awareness of our product because it will be new on the market. So we'll be promoting this awareness and market it. We will gain the profit through the production of alfalfa and the brown juice fertilizer. And in, in, a, in the second phase will be the completing the puzzle because our, our, we believe that our product will take over the market by storm because it will be affordable and very and the, the, the thing that is, has high quality and very affordable will take the market. So many people want to invest in the production of our alfalfa-based products to mean that we'll, be, we'll then be offering them our technology. We'll, we'll offer the technology to those startups and those people want to invest in our production. So in both of our phases, we'll be purpose-driven. We use the purpose-driven business model where we will not only be focusing on generating profits, but rather than having uh, uh, an environmental impact and a social impact in our society. Uh, to the competition, as I said earlier, we have two major competitors, which are Zamora, Zamora Feed Factory and Gorilla Feed Factory, but they are soya bean and maize dominated in this field. Uh, when it comes to the quality, we all offer the same quality from the experimentation we did. We saw that our feeds impact the animal in the same way. But when it comes to affordability, we are very affordable compared to them because we use locally sourced materials and they use the materials that uh, majorly come from the outside because the local production is very low, as we saw. And uh, of course, we use the, the fully locally sourced materials, those eggshells. Uh, those uh, things considered as waste, and the alfalfa. And even the inclusiveness, we, we are very inclusive compared to them because um, because we use, uh, we, we, the, our things are very affordable, and they, they, they mainly target the large-scale farmers. But for us, we'll be also targeting the medium and the small-scale farmers, which makes us more inclusive to each and every farmer. And what we plan to use the funds that we'll get in this competition, firstly, will be to, uh, in the research and development of our products. Uh, because uh, even though we have did so many things, we developed our feed, but we only developed the feeds for the pigs. Uh, and we, we plan to develop the, the feeds for each and every monogastic animals, uh, such, as, such as rabbits and even the, the chicken. So we, we need to do more research and development of our products. And we'll invest the other 25% in establishing partnership and making the waste collection, uh, collection scheme because our production involves many, much, many and much waste, such as the extras and the cassava brand. So we shall invest this 25% to make the, the waste collection scheme and establishing partnerships. And the last 25% we will we'll invest it in standardizing our products. Yeah. Uh, to, to mean that this use of fund that we'll get in the Wager Prize will uh, enable us to prepare for the phase one of, uh, our phase one of production. So uh, allow me to present my team. It is a diverse team of uh, interdisciplinary team members, uh, which are specialized in different aspects to help us develop this project.
So I want to thank them very much. So thank you. Let me invite you to help us feed our food with the better feeds. Thank you very much. Treasurer, excellent job. Judges, we have some samples for you. So if you want to take some and pass them around. Thank you, Trezor, for the samples. There you go, yes. I'm giving these. Thank you. Start these in the middle. Yes, we'll have some samples. Great work. So we'll let the judges take a few minutes and then they'll ask you questions. In the meantime, tell us, notice that your entire team went to high school together. Is that right? Yeah. What's it like working together at this level? Yeah, working together at this level, even though we attended different universities, we were too connected because we, still, we attended the same high school. We know each other, we know each one, the strength and, uh, and the weaknesses. So we didn't you know, force someone to do things that they were not able to do. When we know ourselves that much, they, it makes our teamwork very easy. Yeah. Yeah. That's so great. How important to have such yeah. cohesiveness. Yeah, really uh, also noticed as well that, that for your team to go from an idea to come to an actual prototype was a really pivotal moment for you. What did that feel like? Yeah, it was really a hard work because you have to combine it with the classes. You know, the university schedules, you are still the bachelor's student and the bachelor's level, you know, the assignments, the, it's, it's really hard. But we did find the time. Uh, we did find the time to do it, uh, even though it was really hard, but after developing the product and testing it and see that it is really, it is really applicable, it was something, that, a very good achievement for us. Yeah, we, we did it. Very much. Yeah, we did it. Congratulations. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Judges, take it away. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Excellent presentation. Yeah, I you. loved it. Thank I loved you. it. Yeah. And I love Rwanda too. Hey, thank you very much. Have you been there? Yeah, many I'm times. <laughs> uh, my question is regarding yeah. pellet. Pellets, yeah. So when you harvest alfalfa, mm. I think the water content is high. Yeah. And in order to make pellet, you have to bring it down to 13, 14% or maybe yes. less. Moisture content. And then you have the binding materials and you have eggshell, you know, mm. which doesn't bind well. Yeah. So the, the first question is how you bring down the water content in your alfalfa. And so, then you have to grind it, I guess. You need energy yeah, to do that. Of course. Uh, to, uh, to lower the moisture content is in the biorefining process. The first uh, step of the biorefining process is the drying. The drying, we can use the dryers like mobile dryers and even the oven to lower the moisture content. Uh, Modulally, when you harvest it, we harvest it before flowering, all 50% flowering. So it has the moisture content that is li like m uh, between 30% and 40%. So we dry it to make it less than 15%. That's when we start to grind it after it, is, it has been dried. And uh, to, to, uh, for the eggshells, uh, we grind it also to make uh, its size more homogeneous compared to those. We, we grind it in the same material so that it can be homo have the homogeneous sizes. Um, and also uh, the binding materials. The, the cassava brand, we tested it ourselves after making our first pellets. We saw that the cassava brand, due to its high carbohydrate content, for itself, it is a binding material. Like for that uh, sample you see there, we didn't use any binding material. The cassava brand for itself, it was, it was great. And you can see it is a very hard pellet. Yeah, it is about a month, one month pellet, so you can see there. So for the binding materials, the cassava brand does its work. And we, we use the oven and the dryer to reduce the moisture content to below 15%. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. I have a question on the eggshell component. Yeah. First question is, what ratio of eggshell to all the other materials? Yes. And then how do you cost effectively <clears throat> acquire all that eggshell from what must be so many yes. small quantity sources. Mm. Uh, the, the, the eggshells uh, is actually the lowest. It's about 5% of the production. For, for this prototype of the pigs, it was uh, between 3% and 5%. For the others, it was the high, higher percentage. But for the collection, uh, the collection is actually high. It's actually hard, though, because uh, we have to uh, acquire it from different positions, from the hatcheries, from the restaurants, as the waste. But the, the thing that we, we have to do that to make it easier because those restaurants and those hatcheries, it's like a waste product to them. So they pay, they pay waste collectors to come and pick them up. But we'll be coming, we, for us, we'll come to pick them up for free. So we tell them this one thing. Build a, co a waste collection center for the eggshells and dump them there. And we, we will come to collect them once a month. 
Yeah, that will ease the transportation cost. Like we have to go there and only once a month to go and pick them up. They have to build that facility to pick, to pick them in so they don't have to face those costs of uh, paying those waste collectors to come and pick them up. It will be coming to pick them up for free. So it will be more cost effective for us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks very much <clears throat> for your presentation. Um, one question for you is around the alfalfa and yes. the land needed to mm. grow the alfalfa. Mm. Can you speak to what's necessary in terms of cultivating, um, in terms of the, the land that you need, and the scale up potentially if you're yes. going to increase production? What does that mean for competition for land mm. or how are you avoiding that if, yeah. if you have a solution? Yeah, for, for the production of alfalfa, we won't be the one producing. As I said in Rwanda, the production of alfalfa is pretty high, but it is underutilized. Uh, many farmers don't know that alfalfa has the rich protein content like 30% and, and above. They only use it as the cover crop when they, they, are, they are doing the land furrowing. And after doing that, they put it in the, in, the, in the fields such as the crop residue. Imagine having a 30% plus protein content plant and putting in the field as a plant residue. That's really wasting the resource. And sometimes they use it as a forage to feed the cows. And the cows don't tend to like it because they like napier grasses better and other types of feed. So what we'll be doing, we will be buying those alfalfa from those farmers who don't know their pressure because they don't expect profit from it. So we, we pay them a little amount of money to get that alfalfa and do use it in our production because it is locally produced everywhere, but it is underutilized. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask you, it's, I've noticed some of the other judges have written this, uh, and you brought up that the, the cows don't like to eat some of the stuff. Yeah, have you done any uh, tests? I mean, have you done any research on are the animals enjoying this? Are they, are, they, um, they, are they eating more of this than the other feeds? Uh, for, for, for the cows, why they're not enjoying this is because it is, uh, it's, it's a herbaceous type of plant. But they like uh, those, uh, those, the, 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 those leguminous plants, like the napier glasses that are easy. But for them, sometimes they have fiber co the, the big fiber content, that, which makes them to consume very hard. We haven't done any research yet. That's why we need more research and development to know much about this. Because many farmers tend to, to harvest it when the fiber content gets high, like uh, about 100% flowering, which, is not, which makes the cow don't like it very much. But for us, when we produce, we'll cut them out at 0% flowering or 50% flowering when the fiber quantity is not that high. So we haven't done that research to see why the cows don't like it very much, but we, we just think that it's that reason. Uh, so that we'll, after we get the funds, we'll invest in more research and development to see the reasons why and have clear data for that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I would like to know about the social impact. You mentioned that there will yeah. be a social impact. Are we yes. talking about the fact that people will have access to meat? Are we talking about job creation? Are we talking about community building? Uh, what's the mm. social impact? Uh, the solution impact is um, uh, in Rwanda, 70% and above are employed in the agriculture sector, majorly in, um, in uh, livestock production. Uh, so the farmers in livestock production, uh, the, 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 the very first cost in livestock production is the animal feeds. So if we are, if we are providing the affordable animal feed for those farmers, it will mean that they have higher product productivity and higher profitability. So the social impact that we are providing is to those 70 plus percent farmers who are out there who will be, uh, we, 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 in which that we will be uh, giving them low, low cost and affordable cost effective feeds that will help to maximize is their profitability and their productivity. The other thing that we will be also be providing jobs, even though it won't be too much, but we'll be providing jobs which will be in the social impact and also we'll be providing the extension and the education uh, for those smallholder farmers who don't know the use of this alfalfa or the use of the animal feeds. So we'll be doing that social impacts to those local farmers who don't have much knowledge on that. So yeah, that's the social impact that we'll be providing to the, com to the community. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Too. Trezor, how, how do you hope to convince people to use your animal feed over those that they currently use? Uh, it's simple, really. We are offering the, the animal feeds that are really affordable. That really speaks out for itself. Uh, the animal feeds, they, they are offering the same quality, but uh, for us, it is very affordable. It's something for it, uh, it that, is, uh, that, is, that speaks out for itself. And another thing, 
uh, the plan that we plan to use, we, we plan uh, for each, uh, for each like, district that we are going into, we take like, the sample farmers, the farmers that are really known in that community, and we shall give them our sample feeds for free, so they will, they will test it out for their, their feeding to see if they really work out. And we are very certain through our research and development to, to, to give them the fees that we know that we, they will work. If they work and tell them that our price is a half compared to the, to the price that we are purchasing from the others, they will go out and tell other farmers. Like, these feeds, they are doing much the same to what the other feeds that we do, but half of the price. And that will really speak out for itself and it will convince, we believe that it will convince the other farmers to start buy fees from us. Trezor, one question about the technology you're using. It yes. seems like the grinding and the dryers and all the other processing equipment is fairly expensive. Mm. Um, do you have, have you received any interest locally from financial backers or is, is are you depending on funding from the uh, Wiki price uh, start. Yes. Mm, yeah. Thank you very much. So we are still in the process, or well, because we are in, um, we are applying in other grants like IREME grants in the, the local grants they give in the country. Also, uh, Rwanda Agriculture and Animal Resources Boards, in which we call RAB, is also having the the, the the incubation hub in which they are supporting the youth projects like this. So we are in the publication process into those uh, grants provision. Uh, so that we can get extra funds in which they will help us to invest into getting that machinery or the phase one of our production, but, uh, and even also this Wege Prize, which will help us to get the, the, the funds for further research and uh, money to invest into our projects. Yeah. Thank you, mm, thank you very much. I, I am fascinated with your brown liquid. Yes, uh, thank you very love much. It. You love it very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm going to try that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, how do you get it? Because I, I looked at your chemical analysis, Yeah. and it has a very relatively high bricks value and sugar mm. content, you know, mm. in it. Yeah. And, uh, but if I look at the chemical analysis, mm. it, it doesn't have a lot of other things except potassium, uh, of potassium. very so, low nitrogen and things like that. how you get it your, your brown liquid uh, majorly it is due to the fermentation so uh, from uh, the production of these pellets uh, we the, there is the residues such as the steams we only uh, we only put out the leaves because the leaves are, have the low fiber content and the steams have the high fiber content so we take those steams and chop it down and put it in the container filled with water and some yeast so that it can break down and we cover it, it does the anaerobic fermentation after the few weeks we, we, we collect that, that liquid. So we, we don't have much data to it because we haven't done many prototyping to it, uh, but that's the, the production process that we use to get that brown liquid fertilizer. Yeah. You don't add sugar? In it? Sugar, sugar, no, we don't add sugar as a quantity in it, yeah. Excellent work. Thank you so much, judges. Great job. Thank you, Trezor and yes. Team EcoFeed Pioneers. Yeah, Great you. work. And next up to present for EcoCycle is Yanzi Wu studying health economics at University of Oslo in Norway. Yanzi, welcome. How are you feeling today? Terrified, but excited. <laughs> You're going to do great. Thank All you. right, good luck to you. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Today I'm here to present EcoCycle, our innovative organic waste management solution. We will begin our presentation by looking at our solution and its relevance to circular economy. Following that, we will delve into our business model and its real world implementations. Organic waste management is a complex, wicked problem in China. Each year, China produces an astonishing amount of organic waste, over 6 billion tons, including livestock, manure, and crop straws. However, the common disposal methods are outdated and inefficient. For example, less than 33% of crop straws and 40% of manure are repurposed by these two methods leaving the majority of the waste becoming secondary pollution. Despite the urgent needs for improved solutions, 
Emerging methods are challenging due to financial constraints, insufficient facilities, and regulatory barriers. That's why we developed the EcoCycle, our innovative waste management solution that encompasses three key elements. The first one is ori 4 re software. It's patented soil analysis and fertilizer fermentation platform that predicts precise decomposition blends for over 50 crop types based on local soil, climate, and waste conditions. This platform then guides an automated system to combine microbial agents and enzymes with this waste for advanced pretreatment. This catalyst can accelerate chemical reaction and optimize nutrient upcycling. Lastly, the LVAR processor is a patented intelligent waste decomposition device that breaks down large biomass waste into small molecule carbon sources. With its compact design, this processor ensures decomposition efficiency while reducing energy consumption and secondary pollution. By combining these three elements into one single unit, we can achieve higher waste utilization rate, lower energy consumption, faster processing time, minimum environmental footprint, and on-site solution that's leading to enhanced fertilizer quality. Our waste management cycle is straightforward, but yet highly effective. It starts with the collection of waste from breeding and planting farms. With our reforest system, the enzyme and the microbial agents are added for pretreatment. Within the processor, the waste undergoes enzymatic degradation and transforms into um, small molecules in three states, gas, liquid, and solid. These molecules are ultimately converted into liquid and a solid organic fertilizer that can be used by the planting farms, completing the closed-loop waste management cycle. Our solution is rooted in the three core principles of circular economy, eliminating waste, circulating products, and natural regeneration. First, we eliminate waste not only through the upscaling of um, the waste itself, but also through the reduction of secondary pollution. Next, our solution supports continual product circ circulation through both biological and, uh, and uh, technical cycle. In the biological cycle, the waste converts into fertilizer that can boost um, agricultural productivity. In the technical cycle, our device is produced from stainless steel that can be reused, recycled, and remanufactured to maximum its value. Lastly, we favor natural regeneration by using organic fertilizer over chemical alternatives, aiding in ecological recovery and ecosystem conservation. Our solution aligns with several sustainable development goals underscoring food quality, public health, innovation, sustainable communities, and responsible production. Our business model is a joint venture between EcoCycle and the partnering breeding and or farming um, planting farms. The partnership is rooted in collective um, operation and the mutual investment in consumables, uh, equipments, and technology. By merging resources and expertise, this model enables both parties benefit financially from the use and the sales of organic fertilizer. Let's take a look at the largest partnership we have forged so far in a cotton village in Xinjiang. This village has more than 400 farms with a combined area of 10,000 acres. Collectively, they produce 4,000 tons of organic waste, requiring 750 tons of chemical fertilizer or 20,000 tons of organic fertilizer. Recognizing the, potential, poten, recognizing the potential of this cotton waste, our solution steps in and converts them into organic fertilizer tailored for these cotton farms. With the fertilizer, 
they can cultivate high yielding cottons vital for the production of high quality clothing. And the magic of our, of our solution is that we can collect um, cotton crop straws and discarded clothes back into our system for reproduction of fertilizers. During our trial phase, we produce, we process 25 tons of organic waste and produces 30 tons of organic fertilizer daily with 30% less, with less in water usage and 25% less in chemical uh, usage. When in full capacity, our solution can satisfy over half of the annual demand of the organic fertilizers in this region. The competitive analysis highlights that our solution in dark green um, overshines our competitive competitors across multiple key um, metrics. Looking at the SWOT analysis to the right, um, EcoCycle exhibits a host of strains that I just covered. At the same time, we also face challenges such as upfront investment, upscaling from small scale trials, um, high cost of R&D. However, the lands landscape also brings opportunities such as um, more stricter uh, environmental regulation, increasing market demand, and agricultural modernization. Against this backdrop are threats such as stiff competition, regulatory adjustment, and fluctuation in downstream marking conditions that may pose a threat to our market stance. Looking forward, we aim to expand in key agricultural regions by collaborating closely with local partners to establish manufacturing facilities, just like what we have achieved for Xinjiang for that cotton village. Additionally, we aim to advance our equipment and technology to produce byproducts beyond our agricultural scope, such as biomaterials for soil remediation, wastewater treatment, and biofermentation. Before I conclude, I want to thank to all my team members who cannot attend today due to, due to visa requirement for travels. And lastly, I want to thank you all for your attention. If you have any inquiries or feedback, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Great work, Yanzi. We'll Thank give the you. judges a minute to talk. Let's chat, you and I. Sure. I did read in your bio that you are a former ballroom dancer. Is I was a ballroom dancer. Yes, tell us now. about it. Well, um, there's nothing really much to talk about it, but uh, I have been dancing for quite uh, like uh, 10, 12 years before going to college. And then I kind of quit it and just danced socially. Love dancing. So it's so good for you, right? Yeah, it's really nice to connect I, with other it, people. Truly, truly. I also read in your bio you visited 66 countries. I did. I love traveling. That's Thank my you. biggest hobby. And how has traveling inspired your love for the circular economy and, and doing work in sustainability? I think traveling doesn't really do much to the uh, circular economy because it's a lot of waste and the pollution, I guess. But yeah, my, my motivation for circular economy is not from traveling, but more like from my past work experience in startups. And, uh, mm, and that's kind of um, caused me to enter this competition as a health economics background, because I know nothing about agriculture. I know nothing about enzyme microbial agents. So I have to pick it up and uh, learn myself. Good for you. Congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing. Judges, all set. Good luck. Thank you very much for your presentation. That was, that was excellent. Um, I have a question about the technologies that you're bringing together <clears throat> for your solution. My two-part question. First of all, did you and your team develop the technologies and patent them? So that's one question. And then the second is, um, do you have exclusive rights to these technologies, or are you planning to license them to others? What does that look like for you? Yes. So to answer your first question, all the three components are developed in-house. 
So the equipment, the software, Ori Forest Ori software is kind of started from a master thesis with Shanghai Jiao Tong University. And also the enzyme and the microbiome agents is also another academic project within the same lab, um, but uh, from different team member. Um, and the device, the first device, we don't see it anymore, but the um, concluding slide, we have a device that's for small factory, and that's what we um, developed before, but entering this competition, we kind of want to first focus on small scale farms at the beginning. So we want, we present the least um, compact um, portable devices. But the later on, we found out that we can really upscale our solutions to larger communities and also there's a huge amount of investment for the small scale farmers. And that's why we are building larger manufacturing facilities. And so yes. For your second question, whether we are going to license it, we are not sure yet, but probably in the future, we'll consider it. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, yeah, I must have missed the uh, really intriguing um, idea of being able to bring in things like um, spent cotton clothing in your original proposal, which is why it's great to actually have you stand there. These face-to-face -face presentations are really important in that. My question is, because I'm really intrigued about this, is how do you deal with um, uh, dyes and all the other toxins that perhaps go into the clothing manufacturing process? Yeah, for sure. So the presentation is an uh, idea. So that part, um, recycling discarded clothing, isn't really achieved because we are just in the phase one and trial, and it was just one month. But that's the idea that we are going through, and we are going trying to um, advance our technology to deal with all those. But we did uh, have our another case that we presented in poster, that um, concludes actually. So we actually recycle. It's for an orange juice factory. So we actually collected the orange peels and recycled back into the system to produce more. Um, um, fertilizer, but for the closing, for sure, there's some um, sort of different um, decomposi decomposition blends that we have to take a consider into. Yeah. Tu uh, Sintak, how, where are the enzymes and the microbes coming that are part of your system? Where are they coming from? And also, how in total is this different from current practices of on-farm composting? Uh, what's your second part of the question, sorry? <clears throat> How is your system different from current practices of on-farm composting? Yeah, so the ends, microbiome agents and enzymes are kind of developed within the lab. And you can, think, uh, you can think of our machine as a coffee machine. So we kind of put them um, inside um, the machine and they automatically um, determine how much, what's the optimum amount and the variety of them. And, uh, and before we send the equipment, they will send the sample of the soil and the um, waste conditions. And then we will go through this platform and predict what would be the best like, possible um, microagents and enzymes that would be beneficial for this specific farm and crop types. And that's um, our solution. And uh, we, uh, and we have around like 15 to 20 different types of um, microbioengines and enzymes. And those, I wouldn't say they are very different from the existing market, but it's sort of some of um, different. There's a um, small variation that's to increase um, productivity and efficiency. Yeah. Can I, can I just add a follow-up on that one? Um, so the, the different microbes that you need to customize for different um, farming setups. Right. That sounds like a, a business unto itself in terms of being able to produce and customize. How do you how do you aim to do that? Will it be in the? Do you plan to move that out of the lab at some point, or are you still? Would you do that in a university? How do you plan so, to service that market? So it was actually a uh, um, lab production before, but now it's kind of like part of us. Yeah, so it's like um, purely our own business within, just like the device itself. We have a production team for that device, and we have a um, production team, uh, lab team for the enzyme and the microbiome engine. Thank you. I have a question on patents. You said you, 
your organization has already two patents issued. Those normally take a number of years. Yes. And then you mentioned a, a company or something called Clark Duran. And what, what is that? I, what, 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 Clark what? Duran? It was on one of your slides. Yeah. So oh. he's the CEO of that uh, Ori Forry platform. And that's the master thesis project of his. And that's eventually developing, um, developing into a company. And uh, uh, yeah, that's the, that company. But how long has the comp company then existed to the, get these patents? The company didn't, didn't exist much long, I think two to three years. But the technology has kind of advanced um, over the past couple of years, like from at least five years. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Yan Si, uh, congratulations for making it to the finals. Thank you. Um, and your, um, your project is really interesting in the fact that uh, you have been able to optimize so many things, um, the enzyme, the bio um, refining, and so forth. You mentioned in your presentation that it has the potential for re reducing some of the inputs by 25%. Have you done any projections on what you think the ultimate uh, optimization of the process might be? Um, for reducing chemical um, fertilizer or? Um, I think what the 25% was the organics, right? Uh, no, uh, so we, uh, we reduced the chemical use by 25%, oh, but we produced um, the organic fertilizer um, that satisfy more than 50% of annual, annual demand when in full capacity. Okay, then my question is on the chemical input. Okay. What, what do you think the optimal uh, optimization might end up being? Um, that really depends on the, how technology advances in the future. And we aim to like, reduce chemical use as, as, um, um, as much as possible. But uh, the thing is you can of like, Part of the inputs that, that we have was also the chemical um, fertilizer that used in the system. So you also have to add a chemical fertilizer. I have a question regarding, you used your product for the reclamation of salt affected soils. Uh, how you did that? And um, what were the results? Because salt affected soils have very low biological activity plus the high salt content, you know. Right. So, how your product will kind of re reduce salt content? Right. I'm not uh, the person who would uh, be able to answer that question because I'm the least person in our team to know the core, at, um, um, to know about like a uh, soil and uh, plantation. But uh, I'm sure like, I can find an answer later on if you want to have a chat. Perfect. I just have a quick question. Um, in terms of your, your development as a team, can you um, speak a bit to, are you incorporated as a company already? Or are you bringing together existing technologies from existing companies? I guess I'm a little gray in terms of like where, right. where you're at. We are not really a company at all. So we are right at least like ideation to implementation phase. We, have, we are running trial, um, different small scale trials. And the cotton factory is actually the only large uh, factory we are building right now. And we are still testing what's the um, productivity of the fertilizer and everything. But before that, we had like three small scale um, trials within Shanghai and those four different um, mix of different vegetable crops and also the orange factory that I mentioned. So yeah, we are in the trial phase for business to come in, but we are not a business right now. Thank you. Excellent. Great job, Yanzi. Thank you so much. Eco cycle. Thank you, judges. Okay, everybody, such a great audience. We know that that's a lot to take in today, so we're going to take a 10 minute break. Let's stretch, grab some refreshments, and we'll resume with our next prompt, uh, resume with our next presenter in exactly 10 minutes from now. Thanks, everybody. Great to have you all here. Welcome back, everyone. Weggy Prize 2024. 
And next, we have presenting virtually from Costa Rica for Team Senene. Please welcome Anthony Ilalio, enjoying and studying agricultural science and natural resources management at Earth University. Anthony, hello. Hello, good morning. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Great. All right. We're looking forward to your presentation. Take it away. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Anthony Lalio. I'm from Tanzania, representing Senene Farm. Next. So allow me to, to represent to you Senene. Senene refers to a Swahili term uh, connected to a longhorn grasshopper. Next. And in Tanzania, Senene are highly consumed. Next. So this is a typical market area for Senene in Tanzania, whereby we can see women and children uh, trying to commercialize Senene. And in Tanzania, Senene is already employing over 2 million women. That is directly and indirectly. Next. Also, one of the key important uh, part of Senene is based on the harvesting Senene, of, of harvesting of the Senene, whereby traditionally Senene are harvested only during the rain seasons. And from the first photo, we can see one of the traditional trapping methods of, of trapping Senene. So after the harvest of Senene, Senene are always incorporated into the Tanzanians' basic diet. Next. So also Senene is found out to be very nutritious whereby over 37.1% of its body biomass is made up of protein. But currently, there have been a bigger challenge in, accept, in accessing Senene in the market due to various reasons. Next. One of them being the climatic changes. So Senene only occur or appear during the rain seasons. And due to the current climatic changes, there have been high shortages of rainfalls, hence affecting the natural population of Senene and even affecting its supply in the market. Next. And the other challenge is the long transportation distance, whereby in Tanzania, the Bukoba region has been the natural Senene hotspot harvesting area. And Senene have always been transported from the Bukoba region to Dar es Salaam city, a city located over 1,406 kilometers away. One would ask, why Dar es Salaam? Yes, Dar es Salaam has a population of over 8 million people. And also it's considered as an economic hub of the country. Hence, high demand of the product. Next. So these two challenges have resulted now to even the other uh, bigger challenge, whereby now it's very expensive to access Senene in the market. Hence, affecting directly uh, the, the low-income families that cannot afford to purchase other sources of proteins. Next. So this has even resulted to a mega problem now, the malnutrition whereby in Tanzania, over 33% children under five years suffer from chronic malnutrition, and 58% of, of them suffer from anemia with symptoms such as stunting or low head for age. So this is the current situation, and it will remain like this if nothing is done. Next. So then what is the solution that Senene Farm is trying to bring on the table? Senene Farm will be establishing the first mass layering facility of Senene in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, a leveraging vertical bed farming system to grow feeds for the insects. Next. And within our vertical beds, this is where we'll be growing our feeds, then to feed our insects. Then within our facility, we will be having key components such as egg laying chamber, uh, growth chamber, together with the harvesting chamber. And upon harvesting of the insects, legs and wings will be removed from them. And this can serve as potential feeds uh, for chicken. So. An alliance that we've already established with small-scale poetry farmers will allow us to exchange this potential uh, poetry feed with their chicken manure. Then this chicken manure, combined with the waste harvested from a facility that will be made up of the, chick of the insect excretes together with frost, will be used to formulate a biofertilizer that at the end will be used to fertilize our plants within our vertical beds, hence maintaining a circular framework. Next. So this uh, is the appearance of the design of our facility, showing you the main facility where our insect will be grown, together with the vertical bed farm area where our feeds will be grown. Next. So we have done various prototypes and with objectives such as understanding the life cycle of the insects, determining the optimum temperatures to grow the insects, and even also assessing the viable food processing methods for our final products. Next. 
So upon prototyping, we initiated by having preliminary sessions uh, with the expertise in grasshoppers. Then we went on constructing the growth chambers for the insects. Then we went on tapping, trapping the insects in the, in the wild. We even used or employed traditional methods in doing this. Then the collected insects were being transferred to the growth chamber, where they were left to grow and data taking together with analysis took place next. So then the harvested insects were dried, milled into powder, which allowed us now to initiate our phase two of, of prototyping, where we did food processing by, by making cookies. Next. And about the results of our prototype, we found out that uh, the combined feed, that is panicum maxim, together with Mexican sunflower, can serve as potential feeds uh, to grow our insects. And also, we will need over four months before we can harvest the adult insects. Uh, temperatures of 27 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees Celsius can serve as ideal temperatures to grow the insects. And this serves as well because Dalislam lies within these uh, average temperatures. And also we found out that uh, the protein uh, powder harvested from Senene can serve or can be integrated into varied recipes. Next. So about our innovations, one of our mega innovation lies on our water use, whereby all the water that will be used within our facility will be directed to our wastewater garden with, with the main purpose of treating it, whereby this will be helping us to separate fats from it. Then the treated water will be returned to our drip irrigation system, hence allowing us to irrigate uh, again uh, our, our plants within our vertical beds, hence uh, using sustainable way to grow our feeds. Next. And about the material use, we will be using high-density geomembrane plastics together with steel in making uh, our vertical beds. This is due to various reasons, one of them being the durability of these materials and at the same time the potential of having them recycled and also, or, and also returned to the, to the collection centers. And about the energy use, we will be using 100% solar energy, whereby this means we'll be having solar panels. Uh, with key energy use areas such as lighting of our facility in the egg laying chambers to maintain sufficient temperatures for the insects, and at the same time, uh, drying of our insects. We'll all be using solar dryers, as we can see from the photo. Next. So about our numbers, um, we expect or estimate to have a total initial cost of, uh, of over $31,250. And over 50% of this total initial costs will direct it to the facility construction. And 30% of it will be used for the, for the machinery purchasing. Next. So we will be operating in phases. This will depend on the availability of funds. So in our first phase of our production, we will be supplying Senene in fresh. And in our second phase of our production, we'll be doing the fried, dried together with processed products, such as cookies, candies, and even protein bars. So we do not expect uh, to have significant revenues in our first year of our production due to the continuation of prototyping. But we expect to break even in our third year of our production with a net profit of over $31,882. Next. About our market strategy. So we will be selling our products directly to the retailers. If you remember the women I showed you in the video earlier, who have always based them, their lives in selling Senene. So actually, we'll be offering now uh, to them a, a completely supply of Senene annually. And of course, we'll be using local buses uh, to reach out to, to the cities and clients outside Dar es Salaam city. And about our market research, we found out that most of our, of our clients prefer Senene in fresh and dried. And also, about our competitors, yes, we expect to face competitors in the market. But all of them are the retailers who only based on the nature to harvest Senene. Next. So about our packages, we will be using biodegradable packages, more especially for our processed products. But for the fresh senene that we expect to be selling in high quantities, we will be using these big sacks, uh, which, have, which we can even have a potential to do the refilling process, hence reducing waste that can be generated from packaging. Next. So about our triple bottom line, in our social aspect, so we'll be using directly this solution to answer to a problem of malnutrition in Tanzania. And of course, in the near future, help to solve this problem of malnutrition in sub-Saharan African countries, which also face a very similar problem. And over 1.2% of our profit will be directed in offering academic scholarship to disadvantaged children. And we will be doing this in collaboration with BFA, Builders of Future Africa, who are, always, who are already working with over 400 kids uh, in supporting their academic uh, materials. Next. 
So we expect to face challenges, uh, and one of, the, one of it being government regulation and certification, and the second one being high initial establishment cost. And for that reason, we are here participating uh, at the WEGE Prize. And also we are participating in other various seed funding competitions to be able to raise enough funds to fund our project. Another challenge we expect to face is the coping of our idea together with an increasing competition. And for that reason, we will always stay one step ahead because we are going to go on continuing prototyping and maintain a good relationship with the research centers that we, we have already established. Hence, maintain a good quality of the product in the market. Next. So these are the partners that we have worked together to bring this, uh, this, this big idea into existence. I would like to thank them. Next. And this is the Senene team behind this idea, together with our advisors. I would like to thank them all for their support. Next. So let's join Senene Farm in solving this wicked problem of, of malnutrition and hence helping Tanzania and sub-Saharan African countries that are, are being affected by this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anthony. Great work. The judges are going to talk amongst themselves for a minute, so you and I will chat. Anthony, it's been great to learn more about you and your team, also understanding that you're deeply involved in community service, including building homes. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit more about that? Well, thank you. So me and one of our team members named Abdul, who is around there, we, 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 are, we were working while in high school with, with the BFA organization, Builders of Future Africa. So our, we were part of the leadership. And there was this one poor families. Actually, the BFA works only with poor children, but we extended our help going to visit them to their families. Well, we found out over six uh, children with their parents living in the very same house a very small house, uh, and we found that it is impossible to have these children uh, concentrate in their education if they live in a very disadvantaged area. So we went on uh, 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 mobilizing funds to our school together with external members who were able to collect enough funds to build a house for them, uh, which up to, date, up to date they're living there. So, so that's, that's, the, that's it. Thank you. That's beautiful work. Thank you for sharing that with us. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Judges? Okay. All right. You'll have 10 minutes of question and answers with the judges. Good luck. Thank you so Thank much, you. Anthony. Your presentation was so clear. It answered all of my questions except for one. And that is, <laughs> with such a high concentration of the Senene in the, in the facility, is there any danger of, of them escaping, either to danger to people or to crops, if they get out in a high concentration? Well, thank you. So naturally, uh, people have been harvesting Senene in the wild. And they have been uh, this type of, of grasshopper does not eat uh, does not eat maize or crops that people eat. So Senene uh, actually eats uh, grass, feeds from the grass, and they don't directly attack the crops. So it's not considered as a danger insect that people are trying to control. So first and foremost, we will be doing a big control to make sure that our insects don't come out of our facility because, of course, we'll be producing them in high quantities and. And for that reason, we do not expect any, uh, any, any escaping of our insects. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Anthony. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, one question I had was around how you're using best practices from other examples of rearing grasshoppers. Um, just to understand a little bit more about your model being original or are you developing this from scratch or have you seen this happening in other contexts either within uh, you know geographies proximate to where you are or in other countries uh, yeah around the world well so thank you first and foremost uh, currently there's no people trying to grow senene in in high extensive level like the one we want to do uh, most of the people have only done the researches and trying to grow these insects in, in, in the labs. Uh, like, uh, so even our expertise that helped us to come out with this prototyping and, and being able to see that, yes, we can produce them, have all of them tried to produce them in just closed area 
and it has been difficult for them. So actually for us, our prototype proved to us that we can do this in high extensive levels, of course in a controlled environment, and maintain its supply always. So currently there are no people trying to do it. Although research centers and universities in the East African zone, because Senene are also available in this zone, and it's food for most many people who are of low income. So so people are trying to find ways on how they can get it uh, to their tables always. But the problem of seasonality has always been affecting it. So this is going, for, it's going to be the first, a first facility to do this uh, uh, in, the, in the Eastern Africa. Thank you very much. I've, Thank you all. Um, I've got a question, Anthony. Really loved your presentation. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I'm no. really interested in the opportunities that you're trying to re-stimulate the opportunities for women, um, these two million women that have kind of lost um, income as a result of the of climate change and the and the um, the, the loss of habitat for the Senene. Um, yes. Realistically, how many jobs, direct jobs, do you hope to um, reignite as a result of the um, of the farms that you're creating? And will these be presumably different jobs for women and and, and other people as well? Will these be opportunities that need um, upskilling um, or and, and, and will you be involved in that so you know what, what kind of profile we'll be looking for um, and the numbers what, what do you reckon well uh, thank you first and foremost our facility uh, the logistics within the facility as I explained in our circular uh, framework more, more a key uh, a key work area within our facility will be removing legs and wings from the insects because these are considered to be uh, to have chitin that is not is not preferred by humans. So, this work first and foremost within our facility we will be giving women uh, in high percentage to do it because naturally they have been doing it. That is directly and uh, the facility in other key areas uh, uh, managing the insects and feeds creation does not require many people to do it. Uh, but directly we will be offering jobs to to these two million women who have always based their life in, sen in selling Senene. Actually, the aspect of bringing Senene in the Dar es Salaam city lowers down the cost of Senene because if I have to transport Senene of over 1,406 kilometers away, the price will be very high. So now these retailers, these women I showed you in the video, will be having Senene in Dar es Salaam region. Hence, it will reduce the cost of Senene and we will be offering to them um, full employment now in Senene because Senene will, will not be seasonal anymore. So they can easily get Senene from us and be able to raise, uh, to raise funds uh, for their families. Yeah, thank you. Anthony, great, great job. Um, a thank question on um, how many facilities, long term, we'll just have one big master growing facility or regional ones long term? Well, thank you. So in the long time, first and foremost, because uh, we tend to continue doing prototypes. We are still doing prototypes uh, because we want to diversify our production. We do not want only to base on the insects because we see that in the future, there, even in currently, there are people who cannot eat insects, like just consume them directly. They cannot do that. So for us, we are, gonna try, we are trying to see other possible products that we can harvest from it. For that reason, we did, we have already initiated by making cookies, as you saw in our prototype. So apart from that, about our potential to expand, first and foremost, after, uh, after constructed this facility in Dar es Salaam, we will be going directly to, to other uh, uh, East African regions because this insect is consumed in Rwanda, is consumed in Kenya, is consumed in Uganda. And we already have one of our team members from Kenya, uh, Charles Munga. And for that reason, for us, our aim after having a stable facility producing in Tanzania to duplicate this model, to duplicate it into the nearby countries because the insect is known. It's not like we are going to be begging people to start eating the insect, but we're going to be offering now to them an annual supply of it. So, so for us, uh, in the near future, we want to reach to all the East African countries and even to the Sub-Saharan African countries. So the facility actually right now we will be constructing it to a, a, a land of 600 square meters that we have already purchased in Dar es Salaam. So we do not need a very big area that, uh, for us to operate. Of course, uh, as you know, insects, when they lay eggs, uh, its level of, 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 of laying eggs is exponential. When they start laying eggs, one senene can lay over 100 eggs. So 
And from 100 eggs, you're already getting 100 insects from only one. So there's high potential for us producing in high quantities using a very small area. So even if we'll be able to build this facility into different countries, it's still not going to be something that is, is very extraordinary, no. Yeah, but its production is going to be massive. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Um, well, amazing presentation and a great idea. I just wanted to expand on that question. Thank you. Uh, how, is, how, how is it consumed in the other countries beyond the cookies that you made? How were the cookies? Were they good? Um, <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, what, you know, what other, you know, what, are, what, what, how is it consumed in the other countries? Are there other, you know, what are the other possibilities? Well, uh, thank you. So if you remember the very first photo I showed you on how on a plate, a basic plate of a Tanzanian with senene around it. So people always fry the senene. Uh, they, they fry it before uh, so that they can incorporate it into their basic diet. So it's eaten like, like the way you can have fried meat and, and rice or, or, or chips, something like that. So people eat it like that. And that has been a traditional way of eating it uh, within, within, the, within the region. And for that reason, it's even possible. That's why I said uh, for us, we expect to be selling in high quantities fresh senene because people will want to prepare it in their own way that they like. Uh -huh. So, so, so that, that is the thing. Thank you. You didn't answer if the cookies were good. The cookies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the cookies were very nice. Yeah. And actually, we're being helped to do that prototype by, uh, by, 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 by a food processing uh, professor here at Earth University. So we had the flour uh, with us and, and we went on processing. So we were helped in balancing uh, other ingredients because as you know, uh, insects flour and with wheat flour, uh, there, are, there are two different uh, concepts here. So uh, normally bread or cookies are made from wheat flour. So we had to incorporate and do different treatments to see what amounts of, what amounts of of, of wheat and 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 of and senene flour can be mixed together to maintain a very normal cookie that you see and don't see an insect in it with particles or whatever. So so the cookies were great actually. Yeah. Great. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you, Anthony, for your presentation. It was awesome. Um, I have um, another question as well. I would like to know um, if the senene naturally grows during the rainy season. Um, what happens in your facility? Do you have rain? Or how, how do you replicate the natural habitat? Or is it not important? Or how does that work? Thank you. So first and foremost, why do senene only occur during the rain seasons? So they occur during the rain seasons due to abundan, uh, abundance of feeds, because they feed on grass. And the Bukoba region that I was talking about earlier, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tropical uh, humid area. So there's heavy rainfalls. During, during rainfall seasons, there's heavy rainfalls, hence enough uh, uh, feeds for the insects. So within our facility, it will be different because for us, we'll be having first and foremost a vertical bed area that will be growing feed using drip irrigation system to minimize water usage. And for that reason, we'll be having feeds throughout the year. And the insects will be directly being fed uh, feeds that for us we have formulated. So it will be a mixture and not uh, just a normal grass that one will expect because we want them to grow quicker and to have uh, sufficient weights in small quantities. So we'll be feeding them high uh, uh, feeds made up of protein. And for that reason, we even have the grass, uh, uh, the, the, the weed that is called uh, Mexican sunflower that is high in protein uh, in our diet. So, so just to make, to make sure that we are getting senenes of good quality. So for us, we'll be having feeds uh, throughout the year and this feed will be just uh, being uh, fed to the insects directly. So they will always see feed, food with them. Hence, they can go on with their normal life cycle of laying eggs and growing. Yes. Thank you for answering the question. You're welcome. Thank you, judges. Thank you, Anthony and Team Senene Farm. Thank you very much. We have just one finalist team left. Presenting for Team Huzagro is Kalia Kazene, Kaze, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Kazeneza Gavrino. 
When Wedgie Price started, Kalia was pursuing her bachelor's degree in law at University of Rokla in Poland and is now a graduate student in international law and diplomacy at Lancaster University in the UK. It is so great to have you here. Thank you. Are you ready? I think so. You've got it. You've got it. The stage is yours. Good luck, Kalila. Thank you. So, oh, dear judges, dear guests, uh, my fellow participants, and the technical team and everyone else, good morning. My name is Gabrino Kelia Kazaneza. I'm an international law student at Lancaster University in the UK, and I'm here representing Hosagra team. Uh, well, I would like to start my presentation with a question. I would like to ask you, uh, do you all know that uh, 350 million metric tons of plastic wastes are disposed by humans annually? And this number is assumed to triple by 2060 if no measures are taken. And before I proceed to tell you what our solution is, I would also like to tell you some of the negative impacts of this wicked problem. As we all know, plastic, plastic, uh, plastic pollution uh, causes human, human health risks. It damages the ecosystem and the environment around. It, it harms the wildlife and the marine life as well, because uh, we all know the Great Pacific garbage patch, which is larger than the size of Texas. Can you believe that? Well, then the plastic pollution in Rwanda, on, precisely on 10th of September 2008, Rwanda has passed on the law of uh, banning the usage, the imports, the sale, and even the manufacture of polythene bags or plastic bags in other terms. But these plastic bags are still used illegally either because there are no uh, available, affordable alternatives, or even because we do not have, I would say, an industry that, f uh, that, that manufactures biodegradable plastic packages. The positive shift, when it comes to the positive shift, I would say that uh, Rwanda has been well known for being a global leader in tackling the plastic uh, pollution issue, but we still need to eliminate the, their usage completely by 2040. And this, and here I think you may all be asking yourselves what our team is proposing. So I present to you the Husagro solution. This is a visual representation of what our team will be doing. Well, as you can see from the diagram, we'll be collecting food waste from restaurants and households. And then uh, from the, for example, by food waste, I mean uh, potato peels, banana peels, and then we'll extract starch from them by the use of, uh, by adding glycerol as a plasticizer. And then we'll add beeswax as coating and then we'll, we'll, that's how we'll manufacture mainly the biodegradable plastic packages. And then for the residual waste that, we, that would have not been used into the process, will then be, um, will then be processed into eco-friendly compost by, by the use of BSF or black soldier flies. And as an addition, will also provide uh, protein larva feeds that will come from those residual waste to animals. And this, uh, our diagram shows how this will represent a, a circular economy because we'll have uh, food waste as our input and then uh, after providing the, the packages and the protein larva feeds, it will then go back to the farmers and the farmers will again provide food and the food will go back to us so it will keep in a circle without losing any value. Uh, 
uh, by uh, we managed to to optimize our costs so that it cannot be uh, expensive we'll use uh, existing facilities. So we'll, we'll, instead of building up new uh, buildings or whatever, we'll just renovate the existing facilities. Uh, we'll use inexpensive locations. We will hire local talents or people from our neighboring communities. And then we'll try to maintain the quality of our products regularly so that we can we can uh, solve the issues up front be, be, before it, it uh, stops our production or somehow cause any problems in the future. In the effective production, we'll extract starch ourselves, we'll f uh, produce the, the film, and then uh, we'll be composting leftover food waste instead of dumping those wastes or into garbages and whatever. It will use those wastes in like our input to manufacture the 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 either the compost, the plastic, the biodegradable plastic packages, and provide protein larva feeds for the animals. And we'll also partner with waste management waste man management companies namely Agruni Limited in Rwanda. Uh, this will help us to ensure that the, the, the West come back to us in, in full, I would say. This is our packages. Uh, I would say that these are like the, the advantages they have over the existing packages. They will replace the traditional plastic packaging and they will be customized as if we all know that plastic packages are mainly uh, transparent, so we can we will try to to manufacture customized packages depending to our clients' needs, and they will be renewable, reusable, recyclable, and they will address the high demand in Rwanda. This is our compost. It will be nutrient rich in protein. It, it will improve the soil health because it won't it will not damage the soil, and it will be organic and sustainable to the environment and the soil as well. This is our Husagro larva feeds. Uh, that's the picture that shows uh, two of my team members when they were, um, uh, when they had the larva feeds. They will be sustainable in protein. They will, they will reduce the feed cost because our cost will be minimal and it will be organic and sustainable. When it comes to the PPP, People, Planet and Profit, our, our solution will create a waste-free system because the waste will again be used as our inputs to provide other uh, the, the packages, as I mentioned earlier. The food waste will be used as raw materials. It will be a closed loop system with zero waste and uh, it, will, it will be sustainable to the environment. Here are our partners uh, that we've already managed to collaborate with, but we're still uh, open to expansion. We have already managed to collaborate with Rwanda Environmental Management Agency, which is REMA, and local communities and businesses, uh, I would say precisely farmers, Winners, which is a company that produces um, potato chips, I guess you all love them. So we'll collect the <laughs> we'll collect the the potato peels from them, and the waste management company that I mentioned earlier, Agroni Limited, that will bring back the 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 waste that we need to extract search from it. And. Uh, we just mentioned four of the 17 SDGs, but they go way beyond seven or eight. We'll help uh, achieve the 12th Sustainable Development Goal, which is Responsible Consumption and Production. We'll uh, help achieve the 13th, which is Climate Action, because we will cut down on the reliability on fossil fuels, and so we will also uh, prevent the, or I would say decrease the emission of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, will improve life on land and life in water, zero hunger, and many more. Barrier acknowledgement. We've, uh, we have 
mention these three, main three, product differentiation, financial resources, and skills and data acquisition. When it comes to product differentiation, we've managed to incorporate uh, the local Rwandan aesthetics so that our, our products will be appealing to the Rwandan community. Like I said, it, they will be customized according to our clients' needs. Though when it comes to financial resources, we'll apply for grants, we'll uh, use our personal savings, we'll even we attended Bwege, that's another one. Skills and data acquisition, we'll be partnering with research institutions to, to make sure that we maintain our quality and provide uh, sustainable uh, products to our clients. The action plan is mainly divided in four uh, main uh, steps. The project setup, the, pro the production and testing, the expansion and growth, and lastly, the sustainability and impact. I guess uh, for the project setup, I already mentioned how we'll be uh, establishing uh, existing facilities just by renovating them. Then for the production, it will be just like uh, the quality control testing to ensure that we provide quality products and resolve the issues before they step on to the, to the next level and interfere with our production. The expansion and growth, this will be like uh, marketing our products, through different platforms. I would even mention social media platforms. And sustainability and impact, this is where we we'll, uh, promote the policy advocacy, uh, monitor environmental impact of our products, and, and so on. And we are here seeking 52,000 US dollars in funding for the pilot production to start or to, I would say, to implement our project. Thank you. I invite you all to collaborate with our team, and you can reach out to us on the following contacts. Thank you. I should clap for myself. You should. You should clap for yourself. Great work, Kelly Ott. That was an awesome presentation. Great idea. We'll let the judges talk for a minute here while you and I chat. Um, did hear that one of your teammates has been a part of Waggy Prize in the past. Is that correct? Yes. And so what was the inspiration to come back to Waggy Prize? Well, because we don't take no for an answer. <laughs> yeah, perfect answer. That's it. I'll say that, well, we, we did not... I would say that we did not have the, the privilege to go on to the, the last step last year. And then we were like, what do we lose? Let, let's just try for another time. Let's do it. it might be us this time. That's right. Good for you. Way to persevere. I love that. Yes. I also noticed, too, in reading your bio that you had trouble finding a laboratory that would work with you to work on the prototype. Yeah. So that took quite a bit of perseverance as well. Yeah, well, that was a challenge, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, well, we're, my team members were located in different locations, so I, could, I think I could have managed while I was still living in Poland, but, but as I was alone, they, Blez and two other of my team members managed to find, uh, should I say, a, someone who works at a laboratory, and they... They became friends, friend with him, and he helped. He actually helped, so we managed. That's great. Way to persevere. Yeah. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you. Awesome job. All right, judges. <laughs> anyway. Well, congratulations on your perseverance. It's obviously paid off, and we can see you here now in the final. So huge congratulations from all those, of all of the judges. Thank you. Awesome badge dropping off there. Um, my question to you is, um, in your presentation, you um, indicated that you were going to collect foods, waste foods from restaurants and various other outlets in and around the city. Yeah. Um, but then you kind of focused very much on potatoes, um, banana peels, um, and a, a kind of like specific ground, uh, coffee grounds, I think it was. Yeah. Um, can you use any food waste or is it you have to be very specific about the food waste that you do use? And if that is the case, how are you going to go about separating that and ensuring that you get that kind of sort of pure uh, quality and uh, kind of streams of, of, of uh, food waste that you actually need? Well, 
Thank you for your question. We actually cannot use uh, any food waste as, as we need to extract starch from the, from the food waste. So we need to, to use the, I would say, the, the food waste that are rich in starch. So uh, for when it comes to the separation, that's what I mentioned earlier, we'll, we'll be working with the, with the West Management Company, which is Agruni. And I would say that they are currently uh, advocating in, in the country uh, about uh, and educating people about separating the, the West. They know where to put the plastics, the biodegradable ones, and uh, papers. So while when, if well we can we will still have the job to separate maybe from tomato peels and orange peels and whatever but at least we'll be having peels in general and then we'll extract we'll take what we need from the west so as we'll be collaborating with that with that um, west management company i think it will be easier for us i have a, a question on um uh, specifically the bags and how you've been developing them in terms of how mature your prototyping is. Have you uh, managed to develop uh, so bags for specific applications? Have you tested the performance of yes. these bags? Can you discuss how, how far along you are in the development of these bags and what applications you're, you're focusing sure. on? Well, uh, in regards to prototyping, we've managed to, to test our bags because uh, we try to put them uh, in, should I say, like, like a tray with uh, some other food waste. And, in, uh, and we added, um, excuse me, maggots. Then in, some, in around 12 to, 12 to 25 days, they were fully compostable, like they had fully decomposed. So, and later on, we reached out to, the, to a laboratory in Rwanda that, that is in charge of carrying out standardized tests. And they carried out uh, a test, a standardized test on the biodegradability of our package, and it passed, really. Can I just follow up? What's the performance in terms of um, the, so the applications, like strength, flexibility, ability to be manufactured, those kind of uh, All right. Okay, when it comes to the flexibility, as I mentioned, we'll be adding, uh, okay, we'll extract starch, then we'll add glycerol as a plasticizer, and then we will add beeswax as coating. That will help with, um, our, our packages will be, should I say, water resistant? That's one. And also, they will be reusable, as I said. They won't be, you can, you won't just throw it away after just using it once. And even, even after reusing it for a million times, when you end up throwing it away, it will be decomposing and it, it won't harm the environment. So I would say that those are the, the key points over other packages that, that we usually had. I got a question regarding your business model. Yes. Uh, you have four products, right, coming out of it. Plastic bags. Yes. Say. You have compost. Mm -hmm. You use solar fly to get protein. Yes. And then it goes to the animal feed. Yes. So could you please explain a little bit about uh, the revenue stream? Which business will give you more money? Yes, uh, from what we esteem, we plan that uh, the, bi the biodegrad... Well, as I said, uh, Rwanda is facing the, the plastic pollution. Not only Rwanda, many countries. Uh, the, so I would say that the plastic bags will be our main focus. As, and this will be, the, should I say, the main business because we do not have competitors in Rwanda. There are no industry or factory that's manufacturing the biodegradable packages. So this will be, I would say, our, our pillar of the business. And then uh, as the other two will come from the residual waste, those are just residues. So the main, 
the main income will come from the packages. Any numbers you have in terms of? Uh... Yes. Should I check them? Because I don't have the numbers <laughs> in my head. Okay. But I can tell you real quick. Yes, we estimate that for the first year, uh, if we manage to like to, to to start up our project, for the first year we'll have uh, the net profit of twenty nine US uh, twenty nine thousand USD. That's the first year. Then the second year it will be sixty four. This will be through mar market strong marketing strategies. And as I said, our plastic packages will be customized according to our clients' needs. So I think this will increase uh, our, our clientele. And it will also help us uh, spread in the country or even outside of the country. And as our packages will be biodegradable, I think we'll even gain other markets from outside of our country. Thank you. I have a question on the packaging again. You said it'd be reusable maybe dozens of times, but that means it has to be cleaned. Yes. And that means with water, and so no biodegradation begins after all those times, and it's still kept in its same original performance. It, it sounds difficult to me. Could you please repeat your question? So, if you if you if the user has the bag mm -hmm. and rewashes it, reuses it many times, does it start to biodegrade, or do, do the does it stay just as usable? Well, as I said from our prototype, we had to for it to actually decompose, it, it had to be uh, put together with the, with the maggots. So, if if kept well in a clean place with a favorable temperature, it cannot actually decompose just by using it that way. But if it's thrown, of course, it will decompose. Thank you. I'm really delighted to hear that the bag has been tested and it's, um, it's uh, achieving in the way you want it to achieve. I'm interested, the other elements of the business, what work you put into those in terms of sorting out the waste, using the black soldier fly larva and managing a facility like this. Can you tell us where you are on that journey? Could you please repeat? On which journey precisely? I, I, I hear that the plastic bags are, or the alternative plastic bags uh -huh. are already working well. Yes. You've tested these. But what about the other aspects of your oh, business? Okay. How well tested uh, are those other aspects? Yes, we actually uh, managed to test our compost. Uh, we, we used the... Um, the, the, the block designs to, that are randomized, like randomized complete block designs, and we used beans as our sample, and we applied our compost just randomly in the, in the blocks. And then after some days, uh, precisely 12, 12 days, we, we, we actually, uh, and even not even those only 12 days, even after when the, the beans grew, we, we noticed that the, the, the blocks with our compost was, should I say that the growth rate was higher on a percentage of 15%. And I think that's uh, uh, a great change or difference. Uh, uh, compared to other cow manures, it was cow manure and uh, the vermicompost. Thank you. Can I ask a quick question on the production process of your bag? So um, I'd like to understand uh, whether, first of all, first part of the question, are you going to do an entire end-to-end -end processing of starch extraction as yes. well as okay, all the way through to production of yes. the bag? Yes. And in terms of producing the bag then, um, what production techniques are you using? In terms? Of, of making the bag, what production techniques are you using? Okay, uh, as, we'll uh, as we'll extract uh, starch our own, uh, we'll uh, produce the, the film, and then we'll, well, I wouldn't be able to answer this question with precision, 
but I know that we'll be able to extract our own starch and uh, apply all, or just like I told you, putting the, the glycerol as, as our plasticizer and the coating of beeswax. We'll actually uh, try to use, I'll say, local ingredients and that are even biodegradable. So that, that's actually our production process. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, judges. Great job, Kalia, and great job, Team Huzagro. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, it's lunchtime. <laughs> Time to digest all these amazing ideas that we've heard today. Feel free to head out around town, enjoy some lunch while our judges deliberate. You've got a tough job today, judges. <laughs> As you know, we will resume back here at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time to announce the winner of third place and $10,000, the winner of second place and $20,000, and the winner of first place and $30,000. For our online audience, that's a little bit of an hour and a half-ish from now, so we will see you soon at 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thanks, everybody. You're a great audience, and we'll see you it too. Welcome back everyone. Maggie Prize 2024. And before we celebrate the winners of today's Waggy Prize 2024, I'd like to welcome to the stage Tara McCracken, president of Kendall College of Art and Design of Ferris State University to share a few words. Tara. Hello everyone. I hope you've been as inspired as I have in witnessing the dedication these incredible students have in improving our world. It isn't just the innovative ideas they presented today that deserve our attention. It's also the process they've gone through to get here. The countless hours of collaboration, research, planning, listening, networking, experimentation, and prototyping that have all led to this moment. And of course, the trial and error and the growth mindset that emerges from failing enough times that you learn to fail forward. Here at Kendall College of Art and Design of Ferris State University, I have the daily privilege of seeing firsthand how creative problem solving can unlock human potential and drive positive change. And much like an economy reimagined for the 21st century, design is never linear. There isn't a straight line connecting beginning to end, only a process that while never leading us in the same way twice, always leads us outside of ourselves towards empathy, humility, and willingness to learn. Today marks the 11th anniversary of Weggy Prize, showcasing bold ideas for the future on a global stage. And with over 1,000 participants engaged in over 50 countries around the world, the message is clear. Our ability to solve wicked problems together is only growing stronger. While the challenges before us may have become more complex and contentious, the solutions have become more innovative and effective. All over the globe, people are realizing, just as our Weggy Prize participants have, that we are always better together. On behalf of everyone here at KCAD, I'd like to thank all of our Weggy Prize 2024 competitors for their hard work, courage, and passion. I would also like to thank the Weggy Foundation, the entire Weggy Prize planning team, and our esteemed judges for continuing to believe in this competition and what it represents. And for those students and educators out there watching, Weggy Prize 2025 starts right now, and we'd love to see you participate. So stay curious, stay connected, and stay energized by the limitless possibilities ahead. Thank you. Thank you, President McCracken. And before we announce the winners, we'll invite our judges up here on stage to give some focused feedback to our finalist teams. Judges, welcome. If you'd like to all come up, we're just calling. It's your choice. Yes. Welcome. Stage is yours. Stick mic. There we go. 
if you if you like. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Tara talked there about privilege. What a privilege it's been for us as judges, and I'm sure for you as an audience as well, to sit through the presentation of these five teams. I mean, we started with 58 teams we heard earlier on from 34 different countries, and we get to this final five where the quality was extremely high, I think we can all agree, which made life very difficult for us poor judges to decide on our one to five. I won't tell you what our one to five is just now, but I'm going to give feedback um, on the first team who presented today, which was Fruy Fresh, and that was Claudine who came in online. And to remind people, that's the charcoal cooler idea um, that prolongs the life of fruit and vegetables. A couple of things first uh, that we're unclear about. We were, we were a bit unclear about the zero energy claim uh, that they were making regarding pumps. And if we had a bit more time, I'm sure we could have gotten to the bottom of that. It wasn't particularly clear how they collect the charcoal or what will be involved in that whole process. And finally, um, somewhat unclear on what role they might play or if they're going to play a larger role in waste education. But over to what we loved. We absolutely loved that they, um, they've targeted where most food is lost. I think um, that was something that really impressed us as judges. They, we love that they've discovered this real need, that they've built a working prototype, and that their solution benefits so many people, the farmers and the people, of course, who will eat this produce, and that they've researched the costs with local farmers to work out exactly how much people would be able to pay for storage. So there's our, our concentrated feedback for Fruity Fresh, and now I'll hand over to the next judge. Thanks, Colin. Um, I'm going to give some feedback on Hoosa Grow. So, um, Kalila, well done on a fantastic presentation. You really represented your team um, in, a, in a really impressive way. In terms of some uh, real highlights for us, um, you have certainly identified uh, a need, not only in your own geography, in terms of there's not other solutions available for biodegradable plastics um, when there's a clear signal that is necessary, both in terms of your policy environment as well as the global need to reduce plastics pollution. Um, that was very well uh, presented and it's a very, very important and, and, and compelling motivator. Also, we wanted to commend your team in terms of your persistence. Uh, year on year, it's the kind of persistence that is really necessary as entrepreneurs to continue on, not just in terms of trying to um, gain support from your idea, but also just in terms of you know, galvanizing a broader set of stakeholders and, and, and your team to continue onwards in, in implementation. So really wanted to uh, commend you for that. In terms of some uh, pointers or some, some uh, constructive ideas for improving in the future, one of the uh, areas is really to think about potential take back um, cycles for your bag when produced. So, you know, bioplastic bags can be, uh, it's really important to think about how they can be returned to soil in a very controlled way rather than just discarded um, in landfill. So that would be a, a point that we would emphasize. And in the broader scheme of things, we would love to see further emphasis on the prototyping of the bags, really understanding what kind of process you're going to invest in in terms of the production process. So, you know, casting or extrusion or any of these kind of approaches to production as you scale up, given that's, that's the, the business model you want to emphasize. And then uh, a little bit more definition on uh, what kind of applications for your bags that you're aiming to target. Um, so, for instance, who exactly what kind of customer segments are going to be purchasing your bags and what kind of performance needs that they have. Um, in terms of, you know, how long do they need to use your bags from taking them from, say, a market stall to their home, and what does that mean for the strength of them versus those kind of things to really elaborate in greater detail would really help us understand how this uh, bag is going to uh, be, you know, a, so a solution in your, in your, in your space. So um, overall, congratulations on a very um, impressive idea, and we wish you all the best in continuing the journey. Thank you. Um, Ishimwe, Izimbi, Salama, Turiyenge, and Trezor, um, congratulations on, on a fantastic uh, proposal. 
Um, and I'm here to talk about EcoFeed and Pioneers. Um, we were very impressed, I was very impressed, uh, with your initial narrative and the conflict and how you spoke about um, the conflict between the human and livestock uh, feeding. Um, it, it really opened my heart. I, I think we can all relate to that. It's an issue that is a global one and that connects with an audience. Uh, for a future presentation, I would suggest to not just leave that for the beginning and keep like put it in the middle and put it at the end. Remind us again that that's what the issue and that's what's at, at stake. Um, just to kind of keep us reminding. Um, the members of the... Uh, um, uh, we were quite impressed with the maturity of the uh, prototyping um, and we quite enjoyed that. We also all appreciated the fact that you guys were working or chose to work with a misused crop um, that otherwise would go to waste. And we've been talking about food waste today plenty. So we appreciated the fact that you guys were tapping onto that and not letting it go to, go to waste. Um, also, the, um, the difference between, uh, well, the, the carbon footprint, in other words, you're trying to um, uh, create feeding uh, for uh, pigs, uh, chickens, and rabbits, which are smaller, and therefore they will uh, impact differently uh, in terms of the, um, the carbon footprint. I particularly enjoyed the farmers' uh, influencers and the fact that you were trying to tap into the community to make and regenerate the community because in the end, I think um, the circular economy is all about that. Um, and we were concerned about the amount of energy that it would take or that it takes to produce all of this with the dehydrating, the grinding, and the pelleting. Um, so that was one concern we had. And another concern we had uh, was with the uh, possible methane production um, between the alfalfa and the uh, soybeans uh, in the digestive uh, tract of, of the beef and whether that would make, that would be something to explore or maybe not in, in the future. Overall, we were really impressed and we hope that, we, that you guys keep going with this. Good afternoon. I'm here to talk about EcoCycle. Um, on a planet where 9 billion people will shortly be here, food has got to be one of the major focal points um, of the uh, circular economy. And EcoCycle has really stepped up to the plate. The judges were extremely impressed with your approach to optimizing both of the nutrient and uh, organic matter and management of uh, farms with advanced technology. This has to be part of the future when just the right amount of nutrients, just the right amount of fertilizers are, are applied uh, at the right time and for the right crop. And although the, uh, the approach is extremely impressive, uh, some of the limiting factors uh, the, or the weak points that we'd like to bring up for future consideration is um, the potential high capital cost of actually implementing this, this system. Um, the, the technology is advanced and it's not inexpensive to, to implement. Not only the uh, uh, the physical equipment, also, but also the intellectual and the, the human skill that will be required. Um, and uh, we would also like to see uh, in the future the desire for more testing and prototyping. Um, the example you gave us was very impressive, um, but we're not sure that that was um, a good example of what, what you might be doing in the future. So thank you for um, bringing such a fabulous uh, concept to us. Um, congratulations for being on the finalists and uh, we look forward to your, your success in the future.
Okay, so that just leaves me the honour of um, providing some feedback for Seneni Farm. Um, Anthony, that was a really, really clear and fantastic presentation. You um, also gave some great answers to the questions that we had, um, and we loved your sense of humour as well. Um, we really appreciate, what we appreciated about your solution was um, it was very elegant and it was a, an elegant closed loop system. And whilst I don't always support closed loop systems um, in the context of the circular economy, because there is a little bit of confusion over that, which I honestly will not go into now, otherwise we'll be here all day. But we did feel that in this instance that the closed loop approach that you had really fitted within the context of the, um, the solution that you were offering. Um, it was local, um, it was um, uh, uh, realistic um, and, and very human and, and really kind of provided um, a solution to, to a great need of nutrition um, at a local level. I think also we were very... Um, uh, we're very excited about your continued support of uh, women and children in terms of kind of um, education as well as supporting the, the local economy. And that was very strong. It was a really strong thread that came through your presentation and also the um, uh, uh, previous kind of uh, submissions that you've made. Areas where we thought that next steps could help to really improve your, um, your, your solution was particularly around um, further prototyping around the habitat in particular. We, we really had a question about whether realistically the area of land that you had was suitable for actually feeding and producing the, the amount of feed that was necessary for um, all, of those, um, all of those grasshoppers. Um, and uh, the second area which we thought would be um, a really uh, great area for you to explore was, and you mentioned it um, a little bit, was how you might scale this out. I mean, this is a great idea and you intimated that there were uh, Seneni insects were, were, were quite common being eaten in, in other countries around um, it, you, I think you mentioned um, Uganda, I think you did, I can't remember, but uh, th certainly three other countries nearby that perhaps might have a similar problem and where you could maybe scale out, not necessarily scale up, but provide input and provide support for um, others in, in the area to, to, to provide similar sorts of solutions. Um, and that's pretty much my feedback for Senene. The final thing that I have is, um, again, a collective comment from the judges is, please send cookies. <laughs> <laughs> we missed that. <laughs> Um, so I think that's um, pretty much us in terms of the feedback for the um, different teams. So am I handing over to anybody? Oh, Ruth, here you come. Yes. Well, you could take that back with you because I'm I take, okay. all set. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, judges. Great feedback and comments. And we'd like to offer, take the opportunity once again to thank all 58 teams from around the world that participated in Waggy Prize. incredible and you should all be very proud of your amazing work it is changing the world and we hope that you will never stop building towards a better future thank you all so much and now it's time to name the winners so on the screen behind me you'll see the trophies we've been giving to our first place team on their own each individual trophy contains just a few of the spheres that make up the Weggy prize logo it's only when each of the five trophies are brought together that the bigger picture comes into focus. Just as it takes the contributions of each individual team member and their unique skill sets and experiences to solve these wicked problems. Plainly put, we are better together. And today we celebrate not just our finalist teams, but the power of collaboration that they have all demonstrated. Now, we've only mentioned the first through third place awards so far, but it's impossible to understate how impressed the judges and the Weggy Prize team are with each of our five finalist teams and what they have shown us here today and throughout the whole competition. Each of these teams gave their all, and on behalf of Kendall College of Art and Design of Ferris State University and its Weggy Center for Sustainable Design, we want you to know how much your effort and your ideas are appreciated. 
So we'll start the award ceremony off by recognizing the two teams who are receiving $2,500 finalist awards for being among the five teams left standing in a global competition featuring some of the best and the brightest college and university students in the world. And that's no small feat. The first finalist award winner in Weggy Prize 2024 is EcoCycle. Come on up. Congratulations, Yanzi and EcoCycle. Okay, and the second team receiving a finalist award today is Huzagro. Please come on up to the stage. Congratulations, Kalia and Muzagro. And now, it's time to name our third place winner. The winner of $10,000 and third place in Weggy, 20, Weggy Prize 2024 is EcoFeed. Come on up. Congratulations, Trezor and EcoFeed. Now the judge's choice for second place and the winner of $20,000 is... <laughs> it's a long one. Sinene. Sinene. Yes. Congratulations, Congratulations Sinene and Abdul Gareza, who is here to accept the award. Thank you so much. And that leaves our winner of the first place $30,000 in Weggy Prize 2024, Free Fresh. Congratulations, Nadine, Claudine, and Free Fresh. And now we'd like to invite all of our finalist teams up on stage so we can give them all one big round of applause and we can hear it for our awesome students. Well, I know we just wrapped up Weggy Prize 2024, but as they say, when one door closes, another opens, and Weggy Prize 2025 starts right now. The 2025 competition will again be open to undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate students from anywhere in the world, and will again be focused on the circular economy. So start connecting and brainstorming today, and sign up for the Weggy Prize mailing list at weggyprize.org for all the latest updates and information. Also, be sure to follow Weggy Prize on social media and join the Weggy Prize LinkedIn group where you can begin to network with other potential participants from around the world. On behalf of KCAD and its Weggy Center for Sustainable Design, we thank you all for coming out to support these students and the mission of Weggy Prize. 
We'd also like to thank our judges for their dedication um, and care in choosing our winners and advising these teams throughout the competition. And again, thank you to Weggy Foundation for unwavering support and commitment to this program. And that's not all. There will be a judges forum tomorrow from 10 to 11.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, right here in this room. Everyone is invited to watch the online live stream of this open discussion, where we will recap the solutions presented here today, give the presenters a chance to ask the judges some questions, and explore what's next for the circular economy. For those of you who can't tune in tomorrow, a video recap of the Judges Forum will be posted to the Weggy Prize YouTube channel in the coming days. But for now, we thank those of you who joined us online and invite you to stay connected. We would love to hear from you. From those of you with us here at KCAD, we invite you to stay with us a little longer to enjoy refreshments, network, and celebrate all of our awesome participants. Once again, congratulations to the winners of Weggy Prize 2024. Thanks, everybody.